Um, so hello, everyone, and welcome to Eversight's August 2023 webinar, Improving Access to Donation and Transplantation Services Through Global Cooperation and Harmonization, the case for the Global Alliance of iBank Associations with Dr. Doctor, excuse me, um, Heather May Chin. Um, a few notes before I introduce Dr. Machen. Uh, first, this webinar and all of our webinars will be recorded and available online for viewing at your convenience. Um, second, all participants are muted throughout the duration of the webinar, but please do ask questions. Um, you can do so at any point in the talk by using the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Uh, your questions will be answered at the conclusion of the talk. And so now on to tonight's speaker. Um, Dr. Mei Chen is an ophthalmic nurse with dual responsibilities across nursing and eye banking. She has led the development of bioethical tissue frameworks, including the Barcelona Principles. She has published widely and received numerous awards and nominations. She has worked in over 30 countries, previously with Orbis and currently as a consultant to the Fred Hollows Foundation, New Zealand. She's a senior project manager at Biobank PI and Lions Fellow to the Center for Eye Research Australia and the University of Melbourne. She's the project officer to uh, the EBANS or iBank Association of Australia and New Zealand, chair to the Global Alliance of iBank Associations. And she's also a participant in the development of the World Health Organization's Global Action Framework for Tissue and Transplantation. She has a particular interest in improving donor awareness, global needs for those awaiting transplant, allocation of tissue towards research and training, and the role of nurses in eye care. And now I will hand the floor over to Dr. Machen and um, take it away. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate the opportunity to present today and share with you information about the Global Alliance of iBank Associations and particularly, hopefully, entice you to be involved in some way. For full uh, sorry, Michael, I just can't seem to forward. Oh, there we go. Full disclosure, I work for the Lions Eye Donation Service at Centre for Eye Research Australia, and I do uh, currently have a fellowship with the Lions. But today I'm talking about the Global Alliance of Eye Bank Associations. In terms of collaboration and harmonisation, it's pretty simple. If we don't work together, we can't develop appropriately eye banking and in turn access to corneal services. There are plenty of phrases and lines that you may know of. For example, we're only as strong as our weakest link or united we stand divided before. They all apply in this situation. If we don't work together, we cannot develop eye banking. The term harmonization is, a, is an, also an interesting term that you may or may not be familiar with. And it's not by any means suggesting, or I'm not suggesting by any means that we all sit around a campfire holding hands and singing Kumbaya. That's not what harmonization means. It means we are coming together, sharing our knowledge, being open and transparent, communicating with each other, and also finding points of both difference and also common commonalities that we share. And we work forward with our commonalities for the greater good. So that's what harmonization is about. It's finding everyone in the community, bringing them together and having a focused goal and finding how we can work together and move forward. In terms of the actual sector for eye banking, I'm taking a different spin on this today. I'm going to talk about it in, in very different terms. So in terms of eye banking overall, it is a niche field in compared to when you compare it to other areas of healthcare. For example, here in Australia, we have something between 50 to 70 individual eye bankers in Australia. That's an incredibly small community when you can compare it to other fields like pathology or operating theatre nurses or, or any other groups. So we have to work together as a small knit community to make things work. And if we're not working together in our small knit community, again, we're not going to advance. Silos is an interesting concept as well. So there are many eye banks around the world who are just doing their thing. There are also countries who are just doing their thing. And they don't necessarily interact with other groups and find out what else is happening. So they're working in silos. Often they're repeating things and therefore we're wasting resources. As a global community, we also don't know who we are and what we are and where we're going. We don't necessarily know globally who is working in which other country who is collaborating on other different activities. We don't know who is exporting completely and who is importing completely. And if we don't know who we are, 
we can't really effectively develop future services and systems effectively. We can break it down to um, other areas that we are we are slightly different or where we're having issues. For example, in high resource countries, I know most of you on the call today are in the USA, so you'll recognize competition is a big um, a part of iBanking in the USA. That's not universal. Competition in itself is not a bad thing because it can actually drive new innovations and it propels us as humans to strive for better, to do better and, oh, you've done this, I'm going to do this. So competition is good. However, if it's not managed well, it can be both disruptive and destructive. Particularly, it can erode trust and when there's no trust, it can't work together. And things like inconfidence contracts are a key part of the erosion of trust that it caused because of unmanaged competitive behavior. Notions such as profitization are particularly complex in this field as well. Thankfully, to date, there's only one iBank that's gone down that path. Profitization does not align with the community's expectation and standards of our field, and nor does it align with the standards um, within the field as well. High resource countries, for example, like my own here in Australia, we're also more focused on future needs, whether that's through the provision of tissue for research or whether that's also looking at things such as cellular therapies and bioengineered corneas. Now, none of this is bad. It's just a fact that we are looking more towards the future. In comparison, parts of the world where there is no access to routine tissue are looking more at um, today. They're looking at what they can provide to those that need tissue today. They're also looking at um, issues such as sustainability and actually access to support, whether that's funding or opportunities or actually uh, engaging with other knowledge content experts in the area to develop their service. And this is incredibly important to particularly low to middle income countries because of the 12 million plus people waiting for a corneal transplant that's based on 2012 data published by GAIN in 2016. Most of those, or 80%, are in low to middle income countries and 53% don't have their own iBank. So that access to uh, addressing needs today is incredibly important for those in low to middle income countries. It's also an Comp incredibly complex field, or I should say there's lots of paradoxes and contradictions in this field, which are both uh, fascinating and slightly confusing. So I often wonder how people who don't work in the field look on at us when we say things like, oh, we have surplus tissue, and yet there's 12 million people who are waiting for a corneal transplant, which means that there's no tissue. Uh, that doesn't make sense. We also have complexities around the notion of meeting need and demand where we can meet need and demand in one part of the world, but not another, or even in one location today, they can meet need and demand, but tomorrow they can't. This also equates to when they're moving tissue. So one location, or in fact, one eye bank can both meet need today and not meet need tomorrow. They can export tissue today and then import tissue tomorrow. And that can also be intra-country, not just internationally. That completely doesn't make sense from a global uh, or an, an external view looking in. Additionally, as we move towards future therapies, particularly in my country, we have now other complex issues to consider or debate, which is around the notion of transplantation or research. So transplantation is regarding helping that one person who receives that tissue today, whereas research can help hundreds, if not thousands of people by preventing future um, eye conditions from developing or developing also new future therapies and treatments to treat conditions. So we now have this complex balance, particularly in places like Australia, where we most of the time are meeting need or demand, I should say. We're now starting to look at research and how we balance that across the transplant and research service. It's very delicate. So these are some of the issues that are, are common uh, throughout um, parts of the world. Personhood is also a really interesting and complex area that we have to be aware of. So when I talk about personhood, this is where I get into the bioethics, because everything that we do is based on our donor. Our donor was a person. And so how we treat our donors is incredibly important and how we honour and respect personhood is also important. This is incredibly important when we're talking about importing and exporting tissue across national borders. Think of the consent are also important when we're allocating to research, what our research is doing with the tissue, and also when we talk about cellular therapies and bioengineered corneas. How do they feel about that? How do they feel about biobanking and all those kinds of things? 
what I would say when it comes to personhood is we need to be very careful about how we're moving forward. Because if we look back at history, any time when personhood is compromised, or should I say persons are exploited, history doesn't look back very favorably on them. So while exploitation of humans may have been appropriate at that time in that particular culture, history doesn't judge them as such. And I'm pretty sure I want to be on the right side of history. So as we move forward, we need to absolutely make sure we are taking forward with us the notion of personhood. So let's get back into a bit of how we started developing the Global Alliance. So one of the key things that I started in 2013 was talking to the WHO. And I met with Dr. Luf Noel, who was the representative for the WHO's uh, human tissues, transplant and cellular field. And he charged me with four things. First was the harmonization, AKA build the Global Alliance of IBank Associations. We've done that. Obviously we've still got a lot of ground to do, but at least we've established the organization also wanted me to address bioethical framework and a bioethical framework addresses most of what I've just mentioned with the complexities around transplant versus research, the notion of personhood, the competition, profitization, and all those kinds of things. They also wanted us to develop global standards. Now, this may not be particularly important if you are in a place where you actually have standards, for example, here in Australia, and you might think, well, I don't really, that's not important. But there are many parts of the world who either don't have standards or who are trying to develop IBANs, and they need the standards in order to take them to their governing bodies, to their funding bodies, to say, this is what we need. And so for those individuals in those situations, developing a global standard is essential. The WHO also wanted us to look at data. So that's data in terms of working out how many eye banks there are in the world and what they're doing. This is an incredibly complex project, but one they felt was necessary if WHO member states, meaning your countries, were to develop effective eye banking and uh, development programs. <clears throat> Around 2009 to 2013, the iBank community itself started to, 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 to gather momentum and many individuals around the world started meeting at side meetings to major conferences to start talking about doing something about coming together as a global community. Towards the end of 2013, uh, my boss at the time, Dr. Graham Pollock, raised funds to, to, to implement a project officer and uh, that was me. And so I came on board towards the end of 13 uh, to start developing the Global Alliance. We established it formally in 2014. We had some very uh, lofty but incredibly important aims, which uh, continue to this day. First of all, developing best practicing guidelines, and of course, sharing information about what's happening with conferences and workshops, developing that register of IBANKS as um, WHO recommended. <laughs> I apologize for my cough. Uh, fourth, also developing global traceability efforts and biovigilance uh, systems. Now, interestingly, that's one we've not necessarily pursued ourselves because both the ISBT 128 and Project Notify manage those elements, but we certainly promote um, those organisations in their endeavours. And of course, advocating for eye donation and eye banking. Mm -hmm. We started with six foundation members. However, we only have five now because the six, which was a parvo, Latin uh, South America, unfortunately disbanded last year. And we very much thank them for their participation over the years. So our founding partners are Europe, India, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, the magnificent United States of America. Uh, we changed our membership structure last year and we welcomed three new individual members and of course our host ever sites, you're one of them. So thank you for becoming one of our sector members. Since inception, we've um, participated and collaborated with a wide range of organisation. First of all, we are now a member of the International Council for Ophthalmology and also the International Agency for the Prevention of Blindness. We support all of their activities and particularly the IOPB with their 2030 Insight Project. So please, um, if, you, if you've not followed particularly the IOPB, please go in uh, onto their website, follow in their newsletters and get involved in their global campaigns to support eye care. We have one formal partnership in terms of an agreement with the Commonwealth Tribute to Life Project. And this is an organization or a collaboration which is looking at ensuring at least across Commonwealth nations that tissue is covered and allocated ethically. Now we only started the partnership last year so I don't have anything to report at this stage, uh, but hopefully in time we will. 
We also endorsed the Barcelona, uh, we also endorsed the Declaration of Istanbul on organ trafficking and transplant tourism. And we also support the recommendations of the WHO in terms of or how they would like to see the sector moving forward with eye banking. And we're also incredibly grateful that we've been invited by the WHO to participate in some of their document development, which I'll show you shortly. This year, we are also super excited that we've been able to collaborate on an event which is happening in Mombasa next week with the College of Ophthalmologies for South and Central and Southern Africa, and also the Ophthalmology Society of Kenya for their annual event in Mombasa. We're doing that in collaboration with the World Union Tissue Bank Associations. <clears throat> it's not been smooth sailing with the Global Alliance. Um, I, I'm just going to put it straight out there. There's, there's no whistles and bangs. One of the biggest issues we've faced is representation. If you think back to how I describe the representations, most of them are high resource countries in our membership, and most of them come from English as a first language nations. This is incredibly difficult when we know, based on the GAIN paper, that 80% of those requiring access to tissue live in low to middle income nations. So they are not being represented on our committee and their voices are not being heard. And so we may or may not be working in the right direction to support them. And that's a problem, particularly if we claim to be a global organization. Resources have always been an issue, particularly with our small membership structure. And uh, um, unfortunately, due to COVID, we've lost momentum and we've lost funding, for example, because we were not able to have a face-to-face -face meeting in 2020 and those sorts of things. We were doing incredibly well momentum-wise until COVID. We were raring to go in 2018, 2019. We had all these projects ready to go. As with everything, came to a grinding halt. We've only really started to pick up our heels and pick up from where we were um, this year. Australia is also an interesting um, thing to mention in this context, particularly as I am one. Basically, the organisation was set up in Australia. It's incorporated Australia, and therefore most of the leadership positions are retained in Australia. Now, that's great for Australia, um, but it also means the smallest population in our membership, because if you remember I mentioned we've only got about 60 to 70 eye bankers in, in Australia, are picking up most of the work, which means Australia is pulling or punching above their weight when it comes when it comes to being engaged in international development of the Global Alliance of Eye Bank Association. I'm incredibly proud of that, and I don't by any stretch of the imagination want Australia to stop, but I would like to see other countries step up to the plate and be just as involved as Australia is. So some of the solutions that we've put in place, um, first of all, we tackled the WHO's recommendation for a bioethical framework. And we achieved that in 2018 by developing and launching in Barcelona with the Catalonian government in presence of the WHO, the Barcelona principles, which are an agreement on the use of human tissue for transplantation, research and training. We use the same processes that the Declaration of Istanbul on organ trafficking and transplant tourism use. In fact, we engage the same bioethicist, Dr. Dominique Martin, in developing our framework. We use exactly the same processes in terms of how many draft rounds, who we invited. Uh, we ended up with about six to seven national and international organisations engaged, and we had over 102 individuals from 83 countries. The important thing to mention here is that we used our commonality, that harmonization, to work out as a common community where our principles rested. So with this particular framework, we look at consent, we look at allocation, we look at research, import exportation, profitization, and also future therapies or, or where we're, we're sort of heading to at the moment. It's now available in all six UN languages. So I highly recommend you go and take a look. If you've not looked at it for a while, a good refresher. If you've never seen it before, please go and pick it up and it's on our website. It's also now been used and referenced in other documents, including some uh, a new WHO document as well. <clears throat> we do also provide support and statements for a wide range of um, activities. For example, with the Ebola outbreak or COVID outbreak, we were able to use the Global Alliance to disseminate messages across the world when it came to eye banking. Uh, we also have general statements, for example, the one I present here to you today, which was a collaboration with the International Council of Ophthalmology and the Corneal Society. And again, it has an undertone about bioethics, but it's all about recovering and allocating tissue 
for surgical use. We've also taken up the challenge of supporting and working with the eye care community because, as you know, eye banking, we don't work in a silo. We don't work alone. We have to work with the eye care community and vice versa if we are to tackle our challenges. So there's two little uh, ones here I wanted to share with you. First of all, the package of eye care interventions, which is published by the WHO. And you'll find in this document a very simple paragraph which talks about the inclusion of eye banking when you are looking at developing developing eye care services globally. And this is incredibly important to have that simple paragraph in this document because this is being read by member states, decision makers and policy makers in, in all parts of the world. And so as they're developing their eye care services, they're now being encouraged to think about eye banking. Uh, we're incredibly grateful for the WHO for including our tiny paragraph, but that tiny paragraph is my shape. So thank you for those who engaged in that activity. We also have supported the IOPB with one of their missions, which was to lobby for a special envoy on vision at the United Nations. We're super pleased that not just the Global Alliance, but also iBank associations and other individual organisations involved in iBanking, and also, for example, hospitals, which also have an iBank, uh, signed the uh, statement. And my host today, Eversight, was one of them. So thank you for getting involved in that activity. In terms of knowledge sharing and resources, we do a lot of knowledge uh, sharing. For example, I'm here today talking to you, uh, but I've uh, presented for you today one that's a visual representation. This is working with the IPB. We now have on the on the eye care web pages, for example, the IPB information about eye banking, and this is sitting side by side with other elements of eye care, which is uh, a fantastic achievement. We were able to pop this on their website in 2017, and we're now at the stage where we're ready to update it again. We also produced for them a corneal uh, conditions page as well, and again, we did that by collaborating with a wide range of people. We also do other kinds of knowledge sharing and networking. We have the World Eye Bank Symposium every two years. The next one is will take place in the second half of 2024. Because we are a member of the International Council of Ophthalmology, we also invited to hold a session inside the World Ophthalmology Congress. And so our next one will be in Vancouver next year as well. Last year, we were also incredibly proud to celebrate, or I should say, um, create an awards session for which we're incredibly proud. So this is providing a very rare opportunity for people in this field to be recognized for their incredible contributions to healthcare. So we created an award system last year where we had a national winner, which was LV Prasad in India, and also an international winner, which was our hosts, Eversight. So we congratulate both of those organizations on their winning achievements and all of their accomplishments throughout the years. And we also, uh, we will be hosting the awards again in 2024 alongside the World Eye Bank Symposium. So in terms of our future, a call to action, which is what I'm doing now, or should I say getting the band back together post COVID is one of our biggest um, goals at the moment. We're also looking at tackling those issues I mentioned around representation. So while parts of the world may not have um, an eye banking association, for example, South Central America and the Caribbean, Africa, Middle East and the Oceanic Pacific Islands, perhaps there are ways that we can work with key members of those communities to to be a representative for the Global Alliance. So perhaps as an advisory position. So these are the kinds of things that we're working to examine because it's really important if we are working or supporting people in other parts of the world, we're doing it in, in step with what they're needing and not necessarily just because I wanna work in their country. Now we're not a development agency, but we are still focused on supporting people from low to middle income countries. For example, by developing resources, using our website, using our platform to develop uh, new materials, connect people who can then develop opportunities for learning or building eye banks, and also working with high resource countries to tackle some of their issues, for example, around the ethics and particularly as we move towards future therapies. We also want to encourage people from high resource countries to get involved. And like I sort of sneakily said before, step up to the plate. We would really, really like to see more and more people involved, whether that's sharing information, sharing time, or sharing financial resources. Now, we are all, in terms of the current projects we're working on, we're limited by how much resources we have. So the main four ones we're working on at the moment is our strategic plan for 2024 and beyond. 
We're also working on the World Eye Bank Symposium for next year, which will be in the second half of the year. In terms of actual projects, however, we're focusing on the standards and the data project. The standards project, as I mentioned earlier, it's about making sure that there is a globally agreed document available for those who want to access who want to build eye banks or, or take the information to their government. We're at a stage now where we're, we're sort of debating whether we make them standards or principles, uh, but at the moment we've gathered all of the information from all of the existing standards from around the world and we've started to map them and chart them and extract commonalities. Data is also interesting. We are re visiting where we were back in 2018. We had mapped all the eye banks in the world, but since COVID, we need to re re redo that. So we've started by mapping the eye banks. Once we've completed the mapping of the eye banks, we will then start looking at the data collection. And so the end goal, and this is just an example, on the website at the eye bank Association of Australia and New Zealand, um, our chair, who's a stats guru, uh, uh, Luke uh, Weiner, um, so in, on, on the Australian website, we have a map of Australia, and as you scroll over, you can see per state what the transplant and the donation rates were. So if you take this principle from global, you can scroll over particular countries and see what the donation, transplant, import, export rate will be. So this is visually how we'd like the material to be presented at global level. And this is incredibly important when we're thinking about uh, moving forward, because we need to have this material or this information available. Um, so for example, I'm constantly contacted by students who are doing research projects and need information about global levels. We have uh, people writing um, articles or journalists looking for information. We have people who are interested in investing in the sector or becoming benefactors benef for the sector. And we also have governments and other agencies who are seeking to develop eye banking services and or simply don't improving donation services or and so on. So having this information available long term, because it will take a long time to build, um, will help all of those people and in turn accelerate the progression of our services globally. I wanted to use this opportunity just to do a quick FYI next week. We actually have a, an event taking place in Mombasa, which I mentioned earlier. This is with both COAXA and the Ophthalmology Society of Kenya and in, in collaboration with Bupa. We're joined by 15 incredible organisations from around the world in holding this event. And it's a side sub-meeting to the general COAXA conference. And so this is the first time we're holding a collaborative event in Africa. The idea is to continue to accelerate uh, momentum in Africa. We started last year in Cape Town with a round table call to action. This is phase two. We're incredibly uh, proud that we've had to increase our capacity size. We did have a capacity for 30 individuals and we've now had to change to a room that will take 80 individuals. Um, so that's just a, a, just a great sign to show how across Africa people are interested in looking at this subject. So there's definitely need out there in terms of providing education uh, to people in low to middle income countries and places where we don't have associations. I, would, I just wanted to do a quick thank you and acknowledgement to Dr. Frederick Correa, who is the president of the Ophthalmology Society of Kenya. Um, Dr. Correa invited us to be part of their, um, their conference by creating the, the side meeting. Uh, and I thank him very much for that opportunity and for the hospitality uh, from himself and the entire team at Wax and OSK for welcoming both the bar Gaba and all of our members um, who are participating both there on the ground uh, with videos or like myself behind the scenes, who is super jealous that I can't actually go to Kenya, uh, but I'm incredibly proud of the team that we have going in on the ground. Hopefully these are the kind of things that we can replicate around the world. So before I close my final call to action, and I wanted to close by sharing with you a particular a statement or a line that I absolutely love, which is leave no one behind and reach the furthest behind the first. That's from the UN Sustainable Development Agenda. I think this is incredibly important, particularly in my situation in a high resource country where we are starting to talk about providing tissue to research. We are starting to talk about bioethics, uh, bioengineered corneas and cellular therapies. And these are all extremely important and necessary. It is absolutely important that we don't move forward without forgetting to bring the rest of the world with us. 
if I haven't convinced you enough about the call to action and the need to be involved, um, my book of the week or my recommendation to you is to, to get hold of a book by Australian philosopher Peter Singer, and it's called The Life You Can Save. I've got my own copy. I flick through it every now and then. And so in this particular book, it is focused on uh, poverty and also on the actions of individuals. But it's a great read in, if I read it with my eye banking or donor cornea hat on and I read it thinking, gosh, I can apply that to my own personal setting or my own organisation in terms of how I can support, whether that's with my uh, time or, you know, perhaps providing scholarship funding for someone to attend an event or perhaps it's with uh, time in terms of um, helping develop an event or even knowledge sharing. And that can also be applied to the organisational level as well. So I highly encourage you to read this uh, book. I'm sure there's an e-version available uh, in other parts of the world as well. If you would like to join the Global Alliance of iBank Association, we have both sector and peer member levels. So the sector one is interesting. So if you are already a member, if your organisation is already a member, of one of the member associations, I hope I haven't lost you with that, then you're automatically a member of the Global Alliance. And if you want to be involved, you just go to your representative and say, I'd like to help. If your association is not already a member, you can your organization can join as a as a, as a sect member, very much like you saw Eversight do. And you can do that separately or you can do that because you want to do be more involved. It's very confusing contact me. Uh, additionally, we have peer membership. And so these are for organisations that are not necessarily involved in the recovery and processing or allocation, but they may be involved in the development of iBanking in the NGO sense, in, uh, in hospitals, and also in other different agencies and distri distributed groups. Uh, so we welcome those into the fold as well, because they're very much part of this global community. Um, so having their voices involved is important as well. I'd be amiss if I didn't close by thanking and recognising a huge bunch of people um, that many of these people work in their own iBank. On top of that, they then volunteer and work in their own association. And then on top of that, they also volunteer for the Global Alliance of iBank Associations. So we're incredibly grateful for all of them who give of their time and their knowledge to make uh, the progress that we have today. And I'm hoping in the future I can have your name on there because I hope that you'll get involved. And of course, I would not be amiss without finishing by thanking the most important group in the world in this field, and that's our donors and our donor families. So we may never know who they are, and we may never be able to thank them, but it, it is without saying that everything that we do for this eye banking field or those with um, corneal blindness and other conditions or those seeking access to future therapies none of this is possible without our donors and our donor families so from the bottom of my heart I thank all of them so that's it so I do follow us on LinkedIn um, it's a great way to find out what's going on and if we're doing any uh, calls to action in terms of looking for someone to be involved in this project or another and if you're not quite sure that's my email address and give me a buzz and if I can't help you, I'll find someone that can. Or if it's a particular project that I know someone else is working on, um, I'll try and link you together. Uh, so try and find jobs for everyone is what I'm saying. So thank you very much. And Michael, I'd like to thank yourself and Eversight again for the kind invitation to present on the Global Alliance of iBank Associations. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Um... <clears throat> I personally learned a lot. I hope everyone else did as well. Um, you know, I just want to echo some of, of like uh, just the smallest bit of what you said and that, you know, there are over 12 million people corneal blind in the world. And, um, you know, uh, countries like the U.S. Uh, export very few in the 30,000 neighborhood of tissues. And the only way to solve this problem is to have eye banking systems on the ground locally in those places where there yeah. are corneal blind. So this is very important work that you're doing. Um, not to add anything, but just to re-echo what you've already said. Um, and so we do have one question in the Q&A, and I think it's in that um, vein of, <clears throat> you know, I think everyone's probably wondering what, you know, you said a lot, what they can do to, to, to be involved. Um, and the question is, what can um, surgeons, uh, so transplant surgeons do? 
um, to support the amazing work of GABA or the Global Alliance of Ivy Associations. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Caitlin. So there's lots of different things that they can do. Obviously, locally, they can support their local iBank um, or their national or regional association. Uh, but in terms of the Global Alliance, what I would do is I'd find out what that particular individual was interested in doing it, and then I'd put them to work. So if that particular person was in South America, I'd say, that's fantastic. How about helping me develop and cultivate an event or a working group in, in your region? So those are the bigger picture. Uh, in terms of the projects, for example, when we're developing standards, um, having representation of surgeons on those committees is incredibly important. There's also other things that surgeons can do, and this is probably testament to why in eye banking, or I should say the provision of eye tissue in comparison to other tissues is so comparatively successful, is because of our engagement with our end users, our surgeons. And so from a surgical point of view, every time you're dealing with government agencies, uh, you're lobbying to different groups for support, bring eye banking along with you. It's if I banks go it alone in terms of going to their local governments or even working with um, uh, ministries of health, they, work, they can only go so far because at the end of the day, they want to know what the outcome is for the community, which is the, which is the recipient. So please, every time you have the opportunity to go to your governments or your ministers or your funding bodies and you're talking about um, blindness or cordial blindness, you need to inject information about eye banking into those conversations. And that is one of the biggest key successes of why eye banking in, in some parts of the world, like here in Australia, is so successful because of those interactions and relationships with our surgeons. So I'd encourage you to do that. Um, if you are in, uh, Caitlin, I don't know where you're from, but um, depending on whether you're a member of an organisation already or not, um, you can ask them to put your hand up to be involved. And so when activities are coming, or you can just email me. And so when activities are coming online, um, I know that you're there and you're interested in doing A, B or C. And I can say, I know just the person and I'll tap you on the shoulder. So there's some of the easiest ways to get around it. And you'll be surprised. So we have a girl here in Australia who is interested in global development. And next week, she's going off to Kenya. First time ever. Tapped her on the shoulder. So you just never know. And the world is our oyster and we're only limited by our own imagination, really. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Um, and it looks like that's the only question we have in the chat. So right. <laughs> um, everybody has their uh, marching orders now. Get out and get involved with the Global um, Association or Alliance of iBank Associations. Um, and uh, like I said earlier, this recording, the recording of this webinar will be available online um, where you'll have um, Dr. Machen's um, information. Um, and so uh, any uh, last parting words before we go? No, just thank you so much. And, and while you're all very quiet today and I can't see you, I just hope that you're bubbling away in your mind about what you could do or how you could help be involved in some way. And I hope to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking tonight. Thank you for everyone um, who mm -hmm. tuned in and we'll see you for uh, the next webinar. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Good night. Bye.